appreciate it now. Um, you know, do some things outside of Tucson because there are a lot of interested beekeepers that don't want to have to make the long commute into Tucson. So we're happy to get things going out, out in Sierra Vista. And um, so if you're uh, not in Tucson and you're interested in that, uh, check that out on Saturday. Um, what's the time? What are you starting that at? Like uh, 10 to 11. 10 to 11 30 great cool so and then we're going to have another coffee and beekeeping meeting here in tucson but it's not going to happen until the 30th of this month so at the, the 30th of march uh, we'll have another coffee and beekeeping here in tucson and we'll try and update the website with details on that um but but yeah those have been well attended and um, so tom will be hosting that and that's like, you want to talk about the fair volunteers? I just want to let everybody know that we volunteer for the fair and try to put together a kind of perhaps two for our meeting next month. If we get together and I need to know what we do about how it's going to tend to be a volunteer. And then, too, I just want to mention I haven't been big on pushing. I'm going to start uh, sending out some emails, listening for anyone who wants to sign up items. So if you are one of those people uh, who's time to please uh, look for that email or just go ahead and shoot the email directly and uh, we'll go ahead and try to make that happen. Wait, what is that? Confine high for the fair? Consign items. Oh, oh consign. Yes. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, so you can, yeah, if you've got any, you know, beeswax, jars of honey, any, you know, lip balms, anything that you make with bee products or whatever, if you want to sell it at the fair. Um, you basically tell us what you would like the club to pay you for it, and then we'll add a, a percentage markup on it and sell it at the fair. And it's a way for the club to make some money and for you to make some money as well off of you know any of the products that you make. We've had people in the past make lip balms that were very popular. We sell jars of honey. So uh, if you're you know if you've got anything in mind that you, you want to do there, uh, let us know. Um, we have had a bunch of requests uh, for, to do school visits and what are called STEAM or STEM events, which is science, technology, engineering, and math and arts. Um, so uh, if uh, we've now got, I think, four or five of those uh, scheduled over the next two months, we've got some of them covered with volunteers. Um, but as more requests keep coming in, we may be reaching out to see if anyone is willing to do that kind of stuff. You basically take an observation hive to a local high school or junior high and just stand around, show people bees, and ask them, uh, you know, uh, answer the students' questions uh, about honeybees. For the most part, here it's going to be basic questions about honeybee biology, so you don't have to feel like you don't have to be a beekeeping expert to um, to volunteer for something like that. Um, but, but anyways, we are getting a lot of requests for that kind of stuff, and we're trying to say yes to all of them if we can, you know, afford the man hours to do it. So, um, that's another thing. Again, if you're, uh, Susan is really kind of coordinating all that stuff. So if you're uh, curious about any of that, talk to Susan. Um, uh, let's see. I think that's about it for the administrative type stuff. So our presenter today, we're excited to have, uh, Greg Denker. He is the uh, owner of American Bee Control, right? And um, he is probably has, has been continuously keeping bees in Tucson almost as long as anybody active and alive right now. I would guess there's probably not many people in the Tucson area that have been keeping bees uh, around here as long as you have. So we are, you know, he's a wealth, a very deep well of, of bee knowledge. So we're excited to have him talk to us today. Um, and he's going to be talking about what are what are the bees telling us, brief overview of, of behaviors and how to interpret them. So whenever if you're going through your hive and there seems to be something going on that doesn't make sense to you, there might that might be that your bees pretty good, at, you know, telling you something that's that's going on with them. So so anyways, um, I'll turn it over to Greg and we're yeah, so you have it. Thank you. I love talking about bees. So can can you turn that on? Oh, I, I, I'm going to talk loud until he turns it on, and then it'll be too loud for a minute. So, so while he's doing that, because I wasn't sure I was going to figure it out in time. Oh, looks like we're live. Is this any better? Yeah. I can't talk to this animated. So, clip it on your belt if you like. Okay, we'll do. Oops. Too close. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, the. I want to jump right into this, but I want, as a preface, I want to say 
Is this too loud? Sound pretty weird to me. How about this? Is, is this good? Thanks, is good? Okay, thank you. So I could talk for hours, two, three yeah, more hours, about what bees do when they're not in the beehive. Things they do when they're out on their own and stuff like that. Just one quick example of this is the uh, this one cluster in this tree compared to this one in this tree. Let watershed difference between the two, but again, I don't want to talk about that. That's a separate presentation. You want to because if your friends ask you, well, bees keep coming to well, this or that, the other uh, fortune or water, whatever. Uh, but let's go just jump right into what you see here. Now, watching the bees come in, sorry, I don't have a veteran, but so we've all seen bees with the uh, pollen on their back legs like that. Um, what if they have just a small fraction of that there? What does that, what does that mean? Have you seen that? I mean, if you do see that, uh, I think the only interpretation of that is that they don't have any young bird. They maybe don't even have a queen. And if they're, if they're a queenless colony and they're coming back with a colony, that's just pretty lackadaisical. Once they start having brood, they a lot of esprit de corps. They, they have all wheels are meshing, everything is going great, and they'll come back with pollen baskets totally overloaded. And by the way, Monica, Alan, uh, you know, if you can chip in on this, you know, raise your hand and, and you know, comment on the things I'm commenting on. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to just talk about what I see, what it means to me, what you do about it. I think we, by and large, can stay away from that during my part of the presentation. I plan to leave a lot of time for questions and answers, and I don't have all the answers, but um, I've been advised to just go really quickly through this and then make note of your questions. I'll be glad to address them and we can kind of make the panel discussion out of this with some of their older, you know, more seasoned beekeepers. Okay, now this is a kind of interesting. So some cells are capped, like down here at the bottom, these are capped cells. That one right there is just being capped when this patient was taken. Uh, there's some extremely young larvae there, and you can't maybe see, but they're basically smaller versions of these big, puffy things. I don't know if you can see this back there in the back, you probably cannot see the segments of those, but they're segmented like most any other caterpillar. Um, some cells have never, up here, these cells have never ever had any brood reared in them. These here have had just one brood cycle reared in them. These ones here have had several brood cycles reared in these cells and being reused. So there's successive layers there. So among, among the things we can observe here is a spectrum of age of, of the comb. I tell you that we can use some things from that. Um, and then the, uh, the larva, everybody I see here, whether they're small or large, can seem to be well proportioned. I mean, and we'll have some other slides later to see what poorly, you know, sickly larva looks like. Um, and then uh, now it's interesting that there, there are some you got some really young ones and some really old ones. So it's not like you go from just the old ones down here, just a band of younger ones to young ones and have the eggs out here. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. How do you know that they've had prior brood cycles? Okay, because when they when they leave the cocoon, the, the cocoon, like silkworms have been bred for thousands of years to give off only white silk. Any silkworm that gives off color, you know, gray or brown silk, whatever they kill them, they don't rear them. So you get white silk and then you dye the silk you know, for fabric. Any color you want, make all kinds of beautiful silk colors. Uh, ancient art carried over to modern day. The honeybees have never been bred for the color of their silks. They only breed this chocolate brown, milk, milk chocolate brown uh, silk. And so what you have here is, is that those have never been colored from that. And I've got another slide on this later. Um, but I just want to point out that, that you can read these like rings of a tree. By, by looking at, at the different colors. Now, see, I can see right through that cell wall right there and then into this cell and look through into that cell because it, it, that cell there has never had any, any brood reared in it. But now this one, you can't see through there because it's had brood reared in there. So you can kind of count how dark it is compared to other ones that you see and kind of get a feeling for the age of the, of the thing. Like, if you're, like, say you didn't inspect the hive for January, February, March, April, whatever, and then you, you find that you have brood in the middle of a frame, how long has it been there? We can kind of back into that, like, well, this queen fired up back in February. Who would have guessed that before Valentine's Day, this queen was laying in like gangbusters in this time. Of course, that's not necessarily true in every case, because it could be comb that they just fired up this year. They actually reared brood in it last year. But anyway, you asked the question, how do you know? And that's how you know. And, that can be useful. So I would say everything is good about all these things. So I don't particularly care for this, uh, the fact that they've mixed ages side by side. I would suspect that these guys maybe had some kind of a problem that the workers came and removed 
in this zone here, remove some of the pupa in there because, or the, sorry, the, well, probably the larva. And then the queen had to come back and lay another round here. And, and that's how we got a young ones here and here. And so it, it's not like what you would expect in a typical hive of the, the brood in the middle, island around that, honey around that. It's, um, it's something funny is going on here. And it could just be that they're rapidly growing and reallocating their resources. Maybe they had honey in here before and they moved the honey out and they didn't all get moved out at the same time so it wasn't available for the queen to lay. You can't draw a whole lot of conclusion from that, but it could possibly be uh, pesticide exposure or even European fowl brood, perhaps, that, and certainly not American fowl brood, but something fishy is going on with these. Uh, now, this is not the best picture, but all these little pinholes here, basically every pupa here has been poked through. So like three days as an egg, six days of larva, after that's capped, 21 days for workers. Three days, 24 days for a drone, 21 days for worker. Um, so here we've got, these all got poked, but uh, what does this tell us? All the brood is dead, there's pinholes in all the cappings that are there. Uh, these, the, the cappings are sunken in, I don't know if you can tell that from the picture. Waxworms been chewing through here, eating up there, leaving, uh, leaving their stuff behind, their uh, webs. And then this comb is old and dark for the most part. We certainly have older and darker combs. So what does this mean? Well, the, the nurse bees are the ones that poke the holes. They were checking on that to see if their, the brood uh, was, was well aligned. And, and if they had been, succeeded as a colony, they would have taken more time there. They would have hauled them out. And, and perhaps they did in these other cells here that are empty. Chances I can see some, some dead larvae in there, dead pupa in there. And um, so they, the nurse bees typically will haul those out of there and, and throw them away, it cannibalize them. That's what needs to be done in the season of that. But, um, but because the hive failed, the nurse bees left and the wax runners took over. So, um, you know, I said I'd stay away from what you should do, but it's pretty case. Don't reuse comb like this. Uh, any questions about that? But, uh, okay, so now here, let me just point out that's a live bee with deformed wings. You see how it's like curled up on the end there? I don't see that. This is curled up on the end here, here. You can't necessarily see it on this bee. So, a couple of dead bees and a live bee. Uh, so they died young, and you tell they're young because they got all this fur on them. They're almost like fuzzies. And fuzzy, talk about that. Um, and but other other, you know, of course these are dead, so they're not going to look perfectly intact. But this bee, to me, it looks like everything's all there. You know, they've got the legs, antenna, eyes, fur, fuzz, everything there. But you no know, wings. What? What's the deal? Well, that can, as far as I know, that can only be a virus in the pupa, in the larval stage. And so the wings just didn't develop. And so it wasn't that they got injured, they, they just didn't, in the metamorphosis, they couldn't grow wings. Um, so I would say that you, you also take a mite count. I've only ever seen one bee like this in my life. And I happened to be with an entomologist, a PhD entomologist, whose whole deal was bee diseases. And he insisted that that bee had the form of wing virus as a larva. And so I said, well, we're here to do mite count as high. How are we going to correlate this? And we did it, had like three mites per 300 bees. So the chances are that little mite level, those mites might have come in from some other hive, not even ever been born there. And so this is, this might have been a virtually mite free hive, and the only one I ever said. But when you only have one of any, <laughs> what can you really tell from that? Any comment on the deformed wing virus? No? Anybody? I was going to say, I've seen deformed wing virus before we ever had. Okay, so deformed wings is, is a... I didn't see it back in the European. Gotcha. <laughs> okay, so maybe it isn't, as my entomologist friend suggested. Uh, only, you know, I, said, I think I said here, likely. You. Okay, now, when I talk about these queen cells here, um, and I probably not spend a whole lot of time, you can't really see one there, because it's, it's, I don't think I have this slide again on here. But the, these are queen cells, they're not a very good picture. Um, that's a queen cell that's been ripped open by another queen. Um, so here's another look at this. So uh, a right queen cell here and a torn open one there because the one that emerged first got out of there. Now, um, I would, for the most part, have a on what we think about this, but I guess we would do, I'm going to go back into this one. Uh, this is like in the middle of a frame here. 
And these are in the middle of the frame. And so those are probably, to my thinking, those are superseded. No, those were emergency, emergency cells. Thank you. And so they started, you know, uh, got to look at my hands now for a second here. So if the cell starts out like this, by the way, that's old dark coma in the lower left there, okay? So the cell starts out like this. When it's got all this cocoon there can be old and dark, the nurse bees can't really tear that open very much and make a downward facing cell out of there. So if they're gonna do a super procedure, like the queen left, it's a swarm, no queen, then they're gonna go to the edges of the comb where they can start with, with the cell that's already there. And uh, they're gonna pick one that's just at the right age and gonna build straight downward and so forth. And but with this kind of a stocking shaped cell to build the queen out of, that's not optimum for the, the growth of the queen's organs and stuff like that. And one of the ways that it appears that they do that is that they just flood it with so much royal jelly that they kind of float the young larvae out of there so that the larva is not back in the toe of this stocking shaped cell. But out here it can grow down without being in inhibited by the geometry of the cell. So oh. I would say that that oh. these cells here and this one here is kind of in the middle of the comb, uh, have pretty, they don't have as good a chance of succeeding because they're emergency cells uh, from the loss of the queen. Whereas this one here, now there is quite a foundation back behind it, but, but this was actually the end of the comb. And it, yes, it's in the middle of the frame, but technically speaking, it's at the edge of the comb and that they, that the bees could make it the way they needed to make it. And so this is kind of an example of a supersedure cell where they planned it from the start to be like that, I would, I would suggest, based on the geometry of the comb. This one here, uh, you felt that. I just want to show that because the queen came, ripped it open, and then the other things came on and they, they you know, cannibalized the rock jelly and the dead queen and the stuff like that. And then over time, they kind of patch up. But while we're talking about queens, I want to point out if you can see that there, it's kind of a flat surface there. And, and uh, that's because when the queen, like a me now instead of the screen. When the queen emerges, she takes her proboscis and she goes like this and she just kind of saws it open like this and then flips it open like a manhole cover, trap door kind of thing. And uh, so when you see this type of thing there, it's a, it's an emerge queen that is successful. Then the other queens emerge simultaneously, they fight it out. Chances are two pretty queens will fight it out. And here, that's you know, the, the, one of the queens that came out of the cell that wound up bleeding like that. You know, there. And uh, so um, here is if this is how the worker bees emerge, just kind of clawing its way out, chewing up really ragged edges. Now, again, I grant you that looks a little ragged there, but this looks pretty smooth there. And this, this queen is emerging head down as they do, and then that's we look. So that could be kind of instructive. If you find cells like this sawed off like that, um, then you know you've got a new queen in the mix for sure. Mm -hmm. sure. Now, in, in, a, in a fight between a virgin queen and an old queen, the virgin is always going to win because the, the reproductive queen, the one that's already made it, her ovaries are full capacity and the whole, her, all of her plumbing is working the way it should. She can't get her tail around and sting the virgin queen, but the virgin queen is a killing machine. She's going to kill the experienced queen. And that's just you know, the way they've got it structured. Can you comment on that? No one differently. I think the virgin queen always wins. No. I think the majority of the yeah. Okay, so let's see, yeah, here. So fanning, you know, so here they're, they're, they're at the entrance, they're pretty much facing the same way. It's not like some of them are head this way and others are uh, you can see their, their wings because they're uh, moving so fast as I can see that. Um, they're pretty much going the same way. The foragers are avoiding it. The foragers like they have you dodge around and say, Where am I going to land? And then they have to land and walk past them. And the outcoming foragers, they get knocked the about. They have to avoid it too because they don't want to get slapped by the wings. At least that's in my observation. But there's nothing abnormal about that. That's just normal. Um, they, even if it's not very hot, if they have a nectar flow coming in, they're going to want to pump a lot of air through the hive to help uh, accelerate the drying out of the honey. They're, they're also inverting honey, cracking the open, like we talked about last month, Bob Benny. Thank you very much, Bob Benny. But, um, and that's giving up heat, but it's also giving up a lot of humidity. And uh, I want to correct my chemistry. So it's actually absorbing the water molecules. Every, every one of those times you crack open the, the sucrose into fructose and glucose. But, but nevertheless, they, they, they take it from like, what, 70% moisture down to, or, or more, um, down to 
maybe 20, 18% moisture. That gives, that's a huge percentage of water loss. And, and the more air they can flow through there, the better that is. Uh, but also they may be doing it for cooling. But also another thing, I, I've been with the, the former research leader of our federal bee laboratory here in town. And he said to me, see that bee? That's alarming. It's giving off an alarm. That's you know, gonna alarm everybody for an attack. And, Sorry, buddy. <laughs> That's a pretty common behavior. I didn't tell them that. But uh, they used to do that for, you know, alarming. Oops, sorry. What's wrong, bud? Alarming is a very real thing, but they also just do it to, to let others know. Like if you've been inspecting a hive, they may, some of the bees may take that to be, especially if you've smoking them, you know, oh, wow, we're in trouble here. What if there's bees out there that don't know we're still alive and our queen is still here? So they, they, they send the odor of that hive out there to, let the other bees know, you know, here we are. Let me keep track of time. Where are we at here? I didn't, I didn't take note of when we started. It's 8.38, but... And when, when do we want to have me stop talking and start questioning the answers? Are we there yet? No, you're done. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, now here are these bees. You wouldn't know from this picture, but they're they're just like, they're not moving. You open this up and they're just all... So I know the grass is green here, but this isn't from an Arizona picture. It's the best picture I can find of a cluster. They just don't move. They're just all like asleep. I've never seen bees sleep. When I've had an observation hive, I had to get rid of the observation hive at my desk because I never slept. It's so fast. I had to stay up night after night watching the bees and then work all day and watch the bees all night. It was so fascinating. And I've never seen in my life be sleeping. And uh, so, uh, you know, what's, what's going on there? Well, uh, Torpor, it's a, this is not very likely you're going to have this in Sonora Desert, but on a cold day, if you ever find clusters, maybe even a swarm cluster out on a branch, they just can't move. Well, it's like bears estivate in the winter. I think a lot of people call it hibernation, but I think technically it's called estivation. And squirrels and others in cold climates, they estivate, they slow down their heart rate, release oxygen, and so forth. So um, they used to go into torpor, T O R P O R. Is that up there? Yeah, that's it. So, um, that's, there's nothing abnormal there. One of the things I do, if I have a hive that I really want to make sure that it keeps on going, is I put an empty box down on the, underneath the bottom board. So I put like top board down, upside down, a string of Christmas lights there, old fashioned, like not LED lights, but they have very gentle heat dispersed over a large area, like maybe a string where half the lights are out, you know, and the other half is good. Put that there around the extension board. Now, most of the bees I have are like you know, all the way from the Mexican border to the Idaho border. And so there's no, <laughs> Most of them don't have power to them, but if you do have a hive that you particularly want to keep warm, I put a distributed gentle heat underneath them, and they do, you know, they just do great. They act as if it's springtime all winter long. I just want to pass that on. Um, so torpor is, is a normal uh, thing that bees do. Okay, now let's talk about robbing, and that's what's going on here. Um, I, I want to show you here. See, see all these speckles on here? Sometimes you see a lot of speckles up here on the front of the hive. I can't speak to it, but, but I couldn't find any. I've taken a number of pictures out. I couldn't find any building here, so I stole this picture off the internet. But um, usually I don't see this much stuff thrown on there, but this would be a combination, at least around here, kind of honey we have here. Um, there might be a lot of crystals there. And they'll just, because you know, ants, they can walk off of the crystal. Bees, they have to adjust it, store it in their crop, fly it back where they're going. And so, but don't, the robber bees, like these bees here, they're just all clustered around here. They could be. These bees that are like piled three deep on here trying to fight the other bees to get, get the honey and steal it, run out with it, they pick over here and rip these open. But for, for some reason, that doesn't happen as much as, as you know, a, a frontal wave of carving these cells open and licking them empty. And then someone breaks open the next one and go there and see. And so uh, once that starts, um, it's just, they really rip the stuff up. They'll rip right through the back wall into the other side and so forth. You just really destroy a lot of stuff there because they're they're they're. Um, that's what I'm observing there. So what what can we say about that? Well, if you see the dirty footprints and stuff there, so a lot of times the, the robins will get stuff on their feet, and uh, they're not going to take time to, to lick it off, clean themselves up when they get back to their hive. Other bees will clean them up and stuff like that, but. They, they're just going to get out of there. So they're frantically focusing on just taking the liquid honey and getting out as quick as they can because they don't know what, I mean, they may think, oh, bear ripped this hive open. This is all going to be over in a few minutes. Our hive's got to get our fair share before all these other hives can get their fair share and rob this thing out. So they're just in a frantic food fight. They just elbow each other out of the way, steal everything they can. 
And so if you see like on the bottom where there's piles of what look to be granular sugar, or something like that, chances are those are the dextrose crystals that have uh, formed because a lot of our honey right here crystallizes really fast, but the robbers can only take the liquid. Now, the, the, a lot of graph, if you have an active live hive, but it's weak. In our business, we're producing a lot of really small colonies with young queens that have to go out and mate and stuff like that. So a mating nucleus where the queen has to fly, those are pretty weak colonies. So you have really small nutrients and stuff like that. But um, you, there's ways that you can figure out if you're being robbed or not. And one of them is the grappling at the surface. So Dr. James Nye, PhD research lab leader, University of San Diego, he's done all kinds of experiments on you know, how the bees engage other bees, how do they send messages to them, they're getting dropped out. And, his, and according to his calculations, the last I knew, he said that uh, if, if, if a hive is getting robbed, they, they want to, there's a, a very important feedback loop. The robbing hives are coming over, ripping this hive off. Uh, if they can, if the victimized hive can send a message back to the aggressor hive that don't mess with us, that feedback signal is, according to his math, according to his calculation, 81 times more powerful than if the bees just kill that rubber bee, because then there's no feedback signal. But if they can send a batch of, don't mess with those guys, man, they hurt me, then that, that's very significant for the robbing hive to turn them off. And so, you know, keep that in mind. You know, you don't necessarily want to be swatting those bees or whatever you think you're going to do to do it. But uh, a, a lot of grappling, fighting, pulling on antennas and pulling on wings and stuff like that by the guard bees at the entrance to your hive, um, that's typically a sign of robbing. And um, then ants, ants are because there's a whole tra uh, trail of ants there. Um, you might want to consider a short-term thing, like uh, I take like two cans, put it, like, take a piece of PVC pipe, lop it off at the right height there, put a rope in the, in the can like that, the space it there, put some oil in the can, for those underneath the hive. I, I don't much do that because if they can't hold their own against the ants, yeah, but one of the <laughs> countermeasures that bees naturally have against being robbed out by ants is uh, propolis. For some reason, they can't, can't seem to, uh, it, it's a great bee, great ant countermeasure. Okay, so robbing, those rapidly at the instruments. Oh, when the bees are coming in, like there's a bee, if it comes in and it, 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 it's gonna land, but it, you can't, you know, maybe it's got pollen or whatever. You can't quite decide what to do. Pollen forager, it's not going to be a robin. But if, if they're not a pollen forager, they come in and really catch that landing, it's because they don't want pollen there. And they're, they're looking around. They're going to be a, uh, a guard bee. And by the way, guard bees, all bees, all worker bees, have temperature sensors up here above their eyes. And so if, if a if a robber bee comes in, it's kind of got this swagger like, I don't want to wait, I've got a heavy load, I've got to be a load over here. And the robber bees are going to be suspicious of that, in, in my view, and that they're going to use a temperature sensor. And if those wing muscles, the largest organ in the body, are not all heated up, then they know this is probably a robber. They're acting like he's got this, you know, this heavy load, but that can't be. He didn't, he wasn't coming in, she wasn't coming in fast. It wasn't coming in heavy. Acting like she, you know, she's got something important going on. Let's, uh, let's smell. And if they didn't pass the smell test, they probably was going to send them away. So the head of the approach in the hive entrance uh, can be a sign of robbing. I mean, not necessarily, but it could be. Um, and then also when they depart, if they climb up the outside of the hive, they take off, but they notice they kind of drop down because they got a heavy load. You can kind of figure that that could be an indication of a robber, especially if it's combined with a bunch of dirty footprints on the outside of the hive, little speckles here and there, almost like pepper got sprinkled out, coarse ground pepper got speckled out, stuck around there. Um, and then also after sundown departure, you know, a uh, forager isn't going to go out and exploit, or probably not, I mean, maybe it's a hummingbird feed or somewhere they can, you know, fill up real quick and get right back. But if you're just doing normal foraging like on mesquite blossoms, and it's after sunset, I mean, not like right at sunset, but like sunset plus a few minutes, you see bees leaving out of the hive there. Chances are they're robbers because they only got to make a one-way trip. This is their last haul of stolen merchandise to get back there. So bees leaving after sunset. They'll do that when, when foragers from that hive will not do. Okay, so oh, this is interesting. I, I really like to see this. So these, this is shiny here, and you can't necessarily tell what this is, so I'm gonna have to tell you what it is. But you've got brood here, there, and everywhere, and yet there's honey all around. If you see that this time of year, chances are they're crowding the queen. So it's gonna seem to the bees that it's time to swarm. 
to get out. This is a fall, uh, uh, fall picture. They're crowding the brood nest so the queen won't lay there and they'll, they'll crowd down into a small area to find the brood nest, a very small area that they can defend over the winter. They can keep it warm over the winter by making a cluster around that, keep the queen and any brood that they may be raising through the winter warm and keep them humidified there. So this crowding the brood nest, backfilling the brood nest, contracting brood nest at the end of the neck as well as what we see here. You see this in the springtime, they're doing that to induce swarming. Any, any comment on, on my interpretation of that? Okay, now what's going on here? Okay, so I just point out, this is a fuzzy, I totally forgot about fuzzy. You can't really tell here because you don't have another bee to put down side by side with this bee. But when they first emerge, you ever see a really light colored bee? Chances are it just newly emerged, it's really clawed its way out of its cell and it's eager to get to work and um, it's just really fuzzy. I mean, fuzzy on the eyes and everything, and, and light colored because of that. You know, bees have four and a half times as many hairs on their bodies as any of us have on our bodies. They, uh, they're just really small hairs. And uh, there's, there's a lot there. And if you look at a scanning electron microscope photograph of their eyes, you'll see pollen grains sticking in the, in the different facets of their eyes and things like that because they're just, well, at least the foragers are just wallowing in pollen their whole life. Their, for their remaining life. So um, let me point out that we've got here, a little bit there, a little bit here, and somewhere I see right over there. What, what is that? But the brood all looks healthy. It's 12 proportion, um, different ages here. And by the way, see, this is a misshapen cell, so they typically didn't lay in that. She comes up, she measures it with her front legs, like forceps, like calipers and calipers. And measure it. So eight millimeters. She turns around. She elects not to fertilize it. Comes a drone. If it's five millimeters, give or take, five point three, whatever. Uh, work herself. She fertilizes it as she glues it to the back wall of the cell. These guys uh, all look good here, but this probably had to do with one piece of comb being built over here on the left, another piece of comb being built. And when they merged, they came down here and they had uh, they had to match them up somewhere or another, and so you have some misshapen cells there. Because um, it's probably starting from either a feral hive or a starter to put across the top rather than the foundation that time. So, uh, so now let's look at this here. These things here, I've never noticed bees that pay any attention to wax worm larvae. But in fact, I, you, I don't think you can. See, I don't think any of us can see this with the naked eye. But you put it on a microscope, you can see little brown globules of eggs all cemented there, and these just walk over them as if they're not there. I, they're, bees paid attention. It's just a normal, natural part of that. But um, if you have a, a, a lot of wax moth activity, um, it has to do with how you're going to store your combs over the winter if you do store comb over the winter. Okay, so trophallaxis here. What's going on here? These bees are not kissing. These bees are not kissing. Um, that's trophallaxis. You know, the work, the field bees, like the foragers for nectar, they're going to come out and come back. They don't put that away. Pollen foragers, they're going to stuff the pollen in itself and go back out. Nectar foragers, they hand it off, mouth to mouth. So trophallaxis is what bees do. So, like when a bird feeds its, uh, it's from this slide there, but uh, spell out the word trophallaxis, where that's mouth to mouth feeding, like a mother bird feeding a chicky. Uh, that's trophallaxis. Bees do it, but this is fundamental to the hive. Like one reason why bees can tell what their hive from another hive is because they hand off to that. So whatever the unique combination of floral resources is there, uh, it causes that hive to have an odor fingerprint that's unique to them because of this. And, and so uh, after the house bee takes it from the field bee, field bee goes back out. The house bee goes in and puts it away in multiple different cells because they're going to homogenize this. Other bees come and pick it up from these multiple different cells. All the while they're putting the Invertase enzyme in there from their the glands in their head, and uh, that's cracking open the sucrose and then turning into honey. But they're spreading around, and so it's in multiple places, with multiple content in each one, and that's how you get honey. And uh, so trophallaxis is really important. And of all the reasons not to feed high fructose corn syrup, so now all the big beekeepers, I don't think there's a single large beekeeper in the country, I mean, like large, like 10,000 more hives, that doesn't feed their bees high fructose corn syrup. When, when I, I haven't found anybody when I talk to these guys. I haven't found anybody that doesn't feed high fructose corn syrup, but it's like a 65 35 ratio of fructose glucose. And the bees don't do it. They think they get that, whether it's internal feeder or uh, top feeder, whatever, they just take it and they stash it in the cell. There's no trophallaxis going on. And so not only is it not having the nutrition they need, but they don't have the trophallaxis. 
So they don't have the, the gears meshing there. So I think I've heard Monica and Will say they're going to feed feed sugar syrup. I think I've heard them say that. Too. Yeah, because then they have to impart the enzyme there, they have to crack it up, they have to treat it as nectar coming in. And it gets all the gears to mesh, handing off from one bee to the other, one bee to the other. A little excited, talking to fast. People want to talk, people want to hear me talk about bees. So, okay, so what's going on here? Let's see. I, I, uh, we've got eggs here between these larvae and different bees. So we've got eggs right up against these here. We got pollen over here. So let's see, let's figure that this is that pollen belt around the outside of the brood nest. But yet we've got uh, capped brood here. This this is the reason this is darker than that is because this comb was older than this when it was there. But um, something funny happened here, kind of like that other one. It says something funny happened here, and I just I'd be very suspicious. I'd be looking around, trying to smell and see if it's a strange smell or other other things going on. Um, I point out here, you can see a little tiny larva in there. There's other little ones that just hatched just today in this picture, but they're all like scrambled and mixed the different ages together. That, that's not a thing, really, for a healthy colony. I mean, this here, this is kind of what I was talking about. We don't, like, these cells that had single root cycle here, the whole rest of the comb didn't have that. Also, these are wax worm droppings here, the wax worm droppings. Yeah, so they eat the wax worms, don't eat the wax, by the way, they eat the proteins. In the pollen, the dead bees, the dead larva, whatever, and the, the cocoons here. And so the waxworm, as far as I know, is the highest fat content of any caterpillar in North America. So if you have reptiles that need us up, then maybe you need a friend that's a beekeeper to give you waxworms. But uh, uh, this is bridge comb here. I just, now some bees just do this. You know, we're breeding for a superior bee. Um, how do you, Somehow, just cannot you cannot stop them from doing this. They just they're, they're bridging, crossing over from one to the other, and, and that's just miserable. I get rid of a hive that, that, that can't be straight down from that. I suspect that what's happening on this particular frame here is that this is so-called small cell size, and the bees aren't having this 4.7 millimeter cell size here, and so they're bridging over there because they just cannot figure out how to use that. They try it here, it doesn't work, so they said, "Well, we'll just build cones and bridge over from one to the other." Use the open space between there. This may also, in this particular one, may also have to do with they, had, they left the frame out, the bridge over to the sidewall, or something like that. Okay, now this is uh, a week ago tomorrow. Uh, Tom Chester and I went out to look. We, this is uh, an uh, apiary that I, it's on land that we lease for the state. I let it, another a former employee was running his own hives. He's retired. And he said, hey, Greg, you got to take over my hives. I'm, I'm just, my beekeeping days are over. So uh, it, it was too early in the morning. The sun wasn't up yet here. And uh, the question is, well, how, you know, how do we know if that's a live hive? Well, the first clue is that I had a crew in there the week before, and they put that feeder bucket on top. So <laughs> they wouldn't put a feeder bucket on a dead hive. They would have done it late in the afternoon, because that's when they were there. So that was my first clue, that that's a rear hive. But I said, well, Tom, Let's get a little analytical here. We shot an infrared image of it. And the, now, interestingly, the feeder bucket here is not bright hot, like the hive is here. But caveat, I think the camera messed up here because this spot here is supposed to be on top of this spot. This spot here is supposed to be up, you know, on the front of the hive right there. Um, go back here. Uh, but for some reason, the infrared image, can you see it's, got, it's supposed to give you the outlines there, but sometimes the outlines. They don't match up, something about the camera. I don't know what, what the deal is there, but so yeah, my first clue is, well, they have a feeder bucket there and it's empty after less than a week. And the second one is that they've got, uh, that's a rib roaring hive, it's just too early in the day for the bee to come out. And so here's another hive, and by the way, this back here, the reason this is hot is because that's the wall of a building, an occupied building, so it kind of throws everything off. But you've got, obviously, the upper box, the lower box, and that's a brick down there, a concrete block. So it's retained a lot of heat. Somehow, concrete blocks underneath rip roaring hive always seem to show up extra hot. I don't see how heat goes down, but it, it, I mean, it does. Okay, so this here, this feeder bucket's half empty. And so the heat rising up through the hole in the top where is warming the liquid. So you see this signature here, uh, lots of bees there. And uh, oh, I should have brought another picture. Because Tom, we, I, we built recently, we haven't had any guests there yet. Tom, other than Tom, Tom Chester, former president. 
of this group. Um, he and I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show this. We put a fence around it. It's got a 50 year old concrete slab that's been abandoned. I figured it'd be a great training apiary, have guests to it, so Tom's only one that's seen it. So I, my crew, they built it. And uh, he goes, are, are these hives all, all live, rip, run, ready to go? I said, well, let's take it out. We did the infrared and everything. He goes, well, how come that one doesn't have any like bright signature like these other hives? So because that was installed from the swarm about a week ago, they don't have any brood yet. It's the brood that's giving off the heat and humidity and because you know, bees will warm that the biggest organ of the body. They shrug their shoulders, warm it up, and, and you can actually take a cluster of bees and pick out the heater bees that are injecting a lot of honey, giving off a lot of heat, warming everybody up, and that's kind of normal what, what bees do. So, um, so we have to tell them about varroa. You know, beekeepers' worst problem, grow on a threaded bee, on a purple drone, and other drone larvae here. So, Varroa destructor, worst problem ever to be keeping, according to the bee here, tell me. Um, now, these are uncapping scratchers. We'll talk about that in just a second. But this is one of the best ways, to, I mean, there's a lot of ways to test for, for Varroa, but if you really want to get down dirty, this one here, it looks pretty stiff and sturdy here, but it's got these tines here. Some of them are like flat, like on a fork you eat with, and some are pokey. I think the pokey ones are a lot better, but basically what you do is you dig in there, like halfway up the drum cells, and you rip them out of there, and you see all these little wiggly pupa. But then you count, going back up here, you count the, you just kind of look and see if you have a big micron or a not so big. Um, so, going down here. And so here's a chemical free way if you want to treat for mice. Overwhelmingly, the Varroa pregnant females are going to want to go on the drone cells, get a sneak in there when it's still in the larval stage, and then start laying eggs in there so they can feed on the drone lard because they have longer pupation cycles. And so, but if you, if you take, uh, you get those uh, special drone frames or just get drone foundation, put them in your regular wooden frames, and that's what you do. Then you take those out when, the, when the, they're in that kind of stage, and because they're once they're capped, and they put them in the freezer, kill them, and then you put it back in the hive, and these will clean it all out, and all the mites will be dead from being frozen along with pupa. Um, I, I, I do drone drafting, and I actually have to go some power. And the reason that, that I do that is because we like to cannibalize the drones after you put them back in. But the mites and vectors and viruses into those drones, and the bees are cannibalizing. They have a tendency to consume those viruses as they consume them. So I, I'd rather do a starter strip, let them draw the drone out, and then cut them out and get rid of them quickly. And, and that's my strategy on it. Like, here's a vector factor of freezing them and putting them back in. My I, I like that. Maybe we should none of this. I, I've never bought any of these things. I would use this um, for more of that kind of beekeeper. But thank you for bringing that up. Any any other great? And please don't hold back. That's really great. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, another option there would be to give the drone frame. If you keep check ins or have a neighbor that keeps check ins, give the drone frames to your check ins. They'll pick every one of those larvae out. And after a day, you can take that frame out and reuse it because the check ins will hold all the, hold all the drones out. Yeah. Well, the bad thing about that is every time you walk by, you frame on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, gotcha. Um, okay, so, sorry, more comment? Okay, I don't want to cut anything else. Okay, so oh, what's going on here? These bees are dead. Their head is down in the cell. These bees are dead. This one died emerging from the cells, flying its way out. It's a cluster of bees on the thing. So the, the brood here died. This one just started coming out. This one's halfway out. So I shot the picture. How did these bees die? We say cold, cold, exactly. And so that's that's what happens when they're they're cold. Uh, they just died from. They, they, uh, I would say cold from starvation. Had they had a feeder on there, they had enough carbohydrates from the sugar water, they could be just now they could warm themselves with that. But they didn't have that, and they died. How oh, cold? You know, it depends on how much food they have. I mean, you know, you can have a hive underneath seven feet of snow and they've got enough of their own honey there. They'll just, they'll just keep going. You know, it, it doesn't, it, and you know, the, like the Vermont, for example, beekeepers, they say bees don't die of cold, they die of moisture because if they can't evacuate the moisture from the hive, then good. But you know, that warming 
uh, the typical thing that the bees do is they store their, you know, they notice all the honeybees. We're talking about the pygmy bees of South Asia or the giant Apis dorsata of the Himalayan mountains and uh, uh, Apis laborioso. All of them store the honey across the top. Well, in North America, with the European honeybees, they, they want to have a, a confined, tall cavity so that the heat and humidity that's given off from the heater bees in the, in the winter cluster will rise up there and humidify and warm the honey. And then the tanker bees go out and use that crop to one of the carries the nectar from the flower of the hive. They use it, carry the honey down, give it to the feeder bees and anybody else who's hungry, triple axis, and then they keep themselves warm. And so gradually over the course of a long Vermont winter, they'll move up in the hollow oak tree and keep taking over successively higher things. And so there's a lot of bees that don't go into winter cluster. They just they've got good enough insulation. They just keep moving up over the course of the winter. Question, please. Insulation? Yeah. Okay, well, you know, if they, pick, if they pick the right hollow tree when they are living in nature, then they're going to have this thermal thing. But also, the bees are really fuzzy, and so they can just pack in really tight close to one another. And, and may, the outer bees may be in torpor, and the inner bees are doing the heating and warming and feeding one another and nurturing grooming the queen and things like that. But bees use their bodies to direct airflow within the hive, to insulate the hive. Then also the, the way they choose to put their, I think like, here's, here's a key difference between Africanized bees and European bees. And, and back when I used to buy European bees decades ago, you know, I would see the brood in the middle, hot one all around, including below, and honey all around, at least maybe not below, but all around on the sides and there. Africanized bees do not do it that way. Honey across the top, all and below that. I mean, depending on how much space they have, if it's a really narrow cavity, like underneath the floorboards of a shed, for example, as Africanized bees seem to bug, then they, they don't have that luxury of having that because they've got to have enough side by sides to give you a space that, that they can actually do their humidifying and warming. So they'll sort of honey on the sides if it's a narrow cavity, like you know, this, which is one reason why a top part hive makes some kind of sense. but. All bees seem to store honey across the top, but Africanized bees, they will put honey, pollen, and then brood right out to the very last cell, the extremely last cell on the comb. Because if you like here in the jungles of Africa, where they spent millions of years, uh, you know, you, any hollow cavity, any uh, kind of thing, isn't going to be around very long. It's going to rot away. Also, there's a whole lot of predators, not just honey badgers, but all kinds of other predators. So they want to be able to just pull out of there and go somewhere else on short notice. And so there's one of their survival techniques, just be able to abandon it and go away. So um, the, the architecture inside the hive, probably more than you wanted to know about insulating, but it has a two. When you can't, you know, Africanized bees have a very poor ability to insulate themselves from the cold because they don't they, they architect the interior of the hive a lot differently. And so they don't survive. Like you know, they you don't have a lot of Africanized bees in the northern uh, the higher climates, higher elevations, and the northern climates like Minnesota doesn't have Africanized bees. As far as I know, I've never heard anybody talk about that. So uh, good question about insulation. Africanized bees can't do it, European bees are experts at it. Any other type question, please? Well, you know, we could quit here. Um, we don't have to say more. We just, we just do question and answer. I have more slides, but um, give me a sign to quit. It's a sign to quit. Um, okay, so here we have ball of brood. I, uh, this is my picture. This picture I got off the web. This has a whole lot of stuff here. They, the eyes are not yet purple. They haven't, and they go from purple to black in the evolution of the pupa, or the, the life cycle of the pupa as they get older. But the, the workers are keeping these open to check on the survival here. And it looks like a lot of these won't survive. Sometimes they get all the way to, to purple-eyed or black-eyed pupa, and they still don't get capped. I would suspect that this is some kind of a European foul brood that caused this. So that, that's a bacterial infection that's kind of, um, what do you call it, episodic, uh, intermittent. It's not like American foul brood is terrible, wicked, contagious. <laughs> Fatal thing, and every state, every municipality, every anybody anywhere that regulates beekeeping says you have a, you have American foul brood. You don't use bleach. You don't use X Y Z. You got to burn that whole entire 
time, every last frame, my uh, word, top word, everything. American Foulbrood is a stinky stuff. I don't have any slides in that because <laughs> you see American Foulbrood in, in, in Arizona. Yeah, we don't, it's yeah. true. But way back when we were young, yeah, so, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we we haven't had that. You know, most all years, like <laughs> all y'all's lifetime, we haven't had American dog. So I didn't I don't have that name. But I would suggest that this may be a bacterial infection. It could also be pesticide exposure. Uh, it took me a long time to figure this out, but there's a lot of people poisoning bees nowadays. And bees get in that, and when that hive dies from someone poisoning it, other bees come and rob that out. That honey is they you know distributed, they diluted in their hive, then other uh, that they feed that to their babies. And so this could possibly be exposure to pesticides. And I suspect that this being my picture, I'm pretty sure this was pesticide exposure that did that. You see the eggs in there. Um, they're, they're certainly making go pollen in there, making a go of it. But, but the, the nurseries, they're very clever about knowing who's, who's sick and who's well. Um, all brew. Um, hey, if you don't mind, I'll give you a little sight that I've been on, on us. So Wagner Ranch, my grandfather found it out. We do honey, we do barbecue sauce, teriyaki sauce, made only with honey, you know, the sweeteners, um, comb honey there, um, honey sticks. Um, if you see these signs out in the desert, that's what our apiary signs look like. They spell out our, our Arizona permit. Um, you can buy names from us, that's what our nukes look like. I don't need to take this. Uh, there's a, we have a lot of, like any other agricultural enterprise, we have a lot of things that we do, but you know, if you happen to know anybody who has a water filtration system or tanker trucks, we need more water hauling capabilities, uh, solar energy type of stuff. You know, somebody's just ripping out their solar. They have a lot of wells that we want to pump water from. Uh, take, take something out. But um, that's why we little ranch. And then this American Bee Control is how Will introduced us. So, you know, we're back at White Hill Ranch. We are a honey producer. We make other stuff. Um, and, but uh, American Bee Control, you know, we've been taking hives out of people's places since I, I was young and had my parents drop me off. Fields houses and work all day and take their hive out back before I was old enough to drive. But um, it typically we do the same day whether we go through a tile roof, a stucco wall, sheet rock, whatever, we patch it back up the first day so we don't paint. Um, so, we, by the way, full disclosure, we don't have that band anymore. The rest of them are still in service. Okay, but um, so we have various different affiliation, not because we're going to brag, but because we're going to contribute. And so this is what that looks like. So we're licensed. So Arizona doesn't. Regulate beekeeping, but we are a licensed Utah beekeeper and the Utah Department of Agriculture and Forestry. And the A plus rating is the Better Benefit Bureau, members of various different things, not Western Agricultural Society. And then, by the way, I have another presentation. This is for the real tech nerds like uh, Ashtray. You can't really see it up there. That's the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning Engineer. They asked me to give a, a seminar. So I talked for like an hour and a half just on all kinds of stuff about you know how bees. Handle that stuff in there. Uh, are we missing a slide here, maybe? Okay, but anyway, th yeah, this slide here. Like, but this is really nerdy stuff. But if you know any engineers that want to talk about heat transfer, including things like fluid amplification and stuff like that, uh, I already got to talk, and I want to talk really nerdy stuff about these being energy importers, not just you know like most other critters and so forth. So that's probably all I'm going to say. Is that, that I have other talks I can give, but I mostly rather be the beekeepers talking about bees. And are there any, any questions? Yeah, I'm fascinated by those swaths of bees. Where do they come from? Triggers on the go. Where do they go? Where do they, do they just go back to where they started? Okay. So, did you already have a question? Okay. About, okay, robber bees, where do they come from? And how does this, how does this work? You know, yeah. So, by the way, the way that a lot of times you can look at a bee and see a robber bee because they are all, oh, they get in so many fights. They're just ripped clean of every last little furry, fuzzy spat patch on their body. Their eyeballs are shiny, more shiny than other bees are. And, but like some bee, so I, I'm pretty sure that the reason why a given hive may have a greater tendency to rob than another is because of the drones that made it in the queen. The queen's going to make it between 12 and 25 drones. And if the drone comes from a oh, robbing intensive hive, you're gonna have more robbers than this. But like, for example, the, the subspecies, the carniola bees, carnies are 
notorious for ripping off everybody that they can. And they they very conservative over the winter. They put, they, put, they grow explosively in the springtime, but they're also very hard to manage because they will rip you blind and you know, rip off everybody. So so some bees just tend more to robbing others as a strain of bees, and others don't. But am I addressing the question you're asking? Are they are they wild or are they coming from another colony? Oh yeah, well uh, probably most colonies once they get to a certain size. Are going to do and, and during certain times of the year, like January, for example, when bees are really after every uh, trash can in front of every 7 Eleven store because they're going to go get whatever coffee or whatever got thrown in that trash can. And, and hummingbird feeders slow down in December, January, right? Early February, um, because they want to bring in all the carbohydrates they can. But if they find a weak hive that they can predators upon they will they will go and rob that out and in fact i had this i don't think i put the slide in here but there was a picture of of a, a robber bee that was so young it still had all its fur on there because evidently the hive that they were robbing was such easy pickings that, that the robber bees would come back to, to such a flow that they recruited these bees that were too young and to, to be robbed to be outside the hive and those bees were joining the robber so it's a cascading effect. And, you know, bees are great at recruiting other stuff. Like in, the, in, in my experience, a beehive will send out just the scouts. Everybody will stay home until the scouts identify the stuff that they can prioritize that's most lucrative to bring back whatever they're bringing back. Like the pollen forages, bring back pollen, neck forages, that. But the scout bees come back with a report and then they focus on those. And part of that is so that they can outcompete the other species, like the bumblebees and uh, butterflies and things like other nectar foragers, they can get there. And there's a famous uh, entomologist in London who would go out and have his tea and crumpets on the porch every uh, every morning at 10. And, and so the bees would come and they'd get some of his orange marmalade from his toast. And then he found out they started coming in five minutes and he, was, he would take his break from writing his book to sit on the porch. And the bees would start showing up ahead of time. So they were already loitering there, waiting for him to show up with the stuff. And so bees have an excellent clock. They didn't have a really good clock. They wouldn't be able to navigate out five miles. Just think how much the earth is rotating out from underneath. So they got an incredibly accurate clock in order to be able to navigate. And they, they know when there's mammal activity or, or other things going on, hey, let's do this. And so I've seen times when we're doing a cutout, daytime cutout from a given time. They're maybe the homeowners there and they're they're uh, yeah, look at this honey. Look at it. husband the honey. Husband, look at this. Uh, and they're dripping honey everywhere. So we're then ten or twelve different hives will find us. We don't do it that way. We we keep all the honey under wraps. We wipe everything up. We don't spread honey all over. But sometimes homeowners or new employees will will do that. Then the next day, I can expect that whatever time of day they had the free food spread all over, the bees from the neighboring hives will come back that time of day to see if it's happening. They don't, they didn't come at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, but because the stuff got started getting spread around 11 30, all of a sudden you've got like 20,000 bees in the air at 11 30, because that's when the lady of the house was dripping honey all over the sidewalk. So, yeah. um, the, the, the robbing is what bees do. It's just a natural, everyday thing for most every colony, as far as I know. And it, and it can really cascade into something tremendous, depending on how easy pickings it is. Am I addressing your question? Very good. I think a, com a common problem, I guess, a question for a common problem that a lot of backyard beekeepers have is they may have two or three colonies in their backyard, and one colony is doing really well, while the other colony just seems to be maintaining and not growing and so if you experience that in your vdr where you see most of your hives doing very well and then you run across a hive or two that are just not growing um what are how do you approach that or what are, you know what do you kind of uh are your thoughts on that can you ever hear the question okay so so how do you manage if, if one hive is doing really well and the other ones aren't and, and it's presumed that, that that strong hive is preying upon the others Sure, yeah. Okay. Well, that's it, both in the context of dropping but also most of your hives are doing well and certain hives are lagging, but what do you, you know, uh, what do you think is the cause of that and how do you, you know, what do you do to try and fix it? 
Okay, so what do you do to fix that the problem? Is some hives are strong, some are weak. So there's, I, I count at least 11 different reasons why people should go into beekeeping, but why people do go into beekeeping. Like some people are just going to do it, have an experience with their family members. That, you know, some of them because they're keeping up with the chicken neighbors. That, you know, these guys got chickens. Now we got to do chickens, but we also got to do bees so we can be, you know, more agrarian than our next door neighbors in this ritzy neighborhood. And, and you're know, producing holiday gifts to hand out to people, um, want to make money off of pollination service. That's a, at least 11 totally, you know, substantially different reasons to go into beekeeping. So Will's question, you got to ask somebody other than me because when I get bees, if somebody pays me to take bees from their house, I baby those bees, I feed them protein, carbohydrate, and everything like that. But once they're up and running on their own, they can't hold their own. I let them die because I'm, I'm all about selective breeding. I'm producing the best bees I can figure out how to derive from the genes that are on those chromosomes. And um, so I'm brutal. I'm, I'm, I'm the most sissy beekeeper you can get. Once I, you know, someone trusts me to take their bees in. Once I get them up, up and running and I know that queen is producing so they can't hold their own. Or if they do other things, like some of the nicest, gentlest bees we can go and inspect them without smoking or anything, just working through the hive like they're the most general European bees. They can't hold their own against robber bees. And so that's no good. You know, if you take them to the almonds, they won't survive the almond pollination. So you can't sell bees in those traits, somebody. Uh, so I guess, sorry, but you know, um, I mean, there's all, all kinds of management techniques that I can read about. I just don't use those. I'm brutal like, once, once they're up and running. I just want to say something about robbery. Uh, give you an example. Years ago, we were having a bee, 20 hives. Okay, you face that way, Morris, because so they can hear you, please. We had to feed 20 hives. We did bulk feeding where we put two bits of nine gallon drums and 1.5 sugar syrup in the yard for the slopes. 16 hours of 20 hives and we got 120 hours. We're not. That's how fast and rapid they can get. Yeah. Imagine that amount. They build two boxes of sugar syrup. Right. Which then they can convert that sugar syrup into honey over time as quick as they can. Yeah. Maybe that's how brutal they can get. Yeah. And then they only let ancient dead bees on top of them barrels. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Any oh, more questions? Nice oh. question. question on, on a the hives one's not doing well and, and this is for the night I kind of work more with the factor I mean I how about that that would be a re queen this queen is, is the main thing that's driving that hive out of that and that's usually that's what happens is beekeepers with two or three hives have one even worse ones and they have one so that hive is I would just be queen in that aspect. Queen and some resources on your hives to. Is that okay? You know, that reminds me of another uh, possible syndrome that may be involved. I, I like your answer. It's not the way I do it. Uh, I mean, but um, on the one hand, it is, and on the other hand, it isn't, because we're always looking for every additional hive we can put a queen into that, that we are. Um, for a line that we are reading on through. But um, sometimes it can be very deceiving. Like um, I know of a farmer, uh, once, who did a deal with a, a farmer that had a triangular piece of land. And so they put a bunch of hives at, at, out of that very tip of that thing because it's furthest away from where they're going to be plowing and stuff like that. And so the hive at the very point back there was just overloaded with honey. That, wow, this hive is really great. Let's check and see how this queen is laying. Because you know, with this much honey production, you know, how can you lose? You know, with a queen this strong, you know, fill up this up. And so they, they went and checked. There was almost no brood in there. What was happening is all these other hives with the there was a crop blooming about a mile away. By the time the bees went there and loaded up on that crop and came back, they were so tired. There was such a nectar flow going on that the, the, the bees at that hive weren't very discriminating. And so all the workers, I mean, a disproportionate number of workers from all these other hives were just going to that hive and artificially inflating its productivity. 
So there, there can be things like that, which is one reason why when you put the pleasure hides on, it's good to have like you put them on, let's say put them on a pallet or something, face them all four different directions so that they have a better chance that make them different colors, make them appear differently so that these can have a visual cue as well as an odor cue as a, who their own um, their own hive is. So you don't have that. And you can actually be more discerning of how well a given hive is doing instead of just like collecting hives from other bees from other hives. Another comment about the same channel. Um, sometimes when I have a strong hive and weak hive side by side, swap positions. That way, the strong hive loses some, the weak hive gains. At the same time, you've also added genetics of the other queen to the hive. So you have a mix of genetics. And sometimes the hive has been struggling. All of a sudden, you have 50% of these are from different genetics pulled right out. No. I'm in the honey production the most common bee illness in Arizona. Oh, you know, I want to say beekeepers. <laughs> but, uh, let's see. Help me with this. Good, good intention. <laughs> okay. The most common bee illnesses would, would have to be the varroa mites. So, like, what if, take for example, humans, we get terrible diseases from uh, mosquitoes, ticks, leeches, the parasites that are that suck our blood, um, you know, terrible diseases, uh, you know. The, the varroa mite is feast, feeding off the fat bodies. In a bee, and uh, the just vectoring terrible diseases. And so, if we could make the varroa go away, we'd be back to the heyday of beekeeping that we had before varroa became the problem. Like the trachea. <laughs> the trachea ones, the trachea throat. There were, there were trachea mites for that, but, but uh, that's, that's, that was nearly the problem. The varroa is still no, a disease no. that come from that. We still lost it percent of our hives. So there, there will be other chances are there'll be other stuff. I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, yeah, the diseases that come from the mites. Question. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Awesome. Yes, thanks. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Greg. Um, if you got this, if you were too excited to ask them in front of them, okay. Good. Yeah, I'm going to Thank you.